I have got a about a 15, 20 year history, work history in learning and development, mainly in the corporate environment. And two years ago, I had a bit of a um, light bulb moment when I decided I really didn't want to work within learning and development anymore. And so I started to reach out to my network of contacts and friends to understand what might be the opportunities within the voluntary sector. And two of my contacts pointed me in the direction of a local citizen's advice. I'm in the Midlands and my local citizen's advice was with Coventry. I talked to the chief executive. I was in a fortunate position that I was able to reduce my hours in the job I was doing. I was able to then go and, and fundraise and write bid writing, but we'll learn how to bid write with them for about three months in the local citizen advice in Coventry before I then was offered a role and worked for them for about 15 months in quite a different lot of areas around strategic change and fundraising. And um, I'm sure Judith will probably echo <laughs> what I've just said in that, <clears throat> lending my hand to all sorts of things while I was yeah. there. Um, I was there for 15 months and it was a fixed term contract. I now work for a, another advice agency within Coventry known as a law centre. We do things um, in a very similar way to citizens advice, but I have stayed in the voluntary sector as a result of beginning to volunteer my time within citizens advice. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Judith Wood Archer and I'm the service delivery director at Citizens Advice Gateshead. Um, I've been with the charity for 17 years. I started as a volunteer um, and then from there there's not a lot I've not done in the charity. Um, I've been I've been I've been through the advice route so um, my very first job was um, one day a week answering the telephone as an advisor um, and um, from there I've done what we call generalist work so advice work. Um, I've done um, a bit of sort of casework where we do more intensive work in depth work with clients, um, which needs a bit more training and support. Um, then I've moved on to um, being a supervisor um, and then um, a manager. And now I'm at the dizzy heights of executive director. Um, citizens advice. Um, we're not um, a big organisation. Each local citizen's advice, and I, I'll, I'll just tell you now, we no longer use the word Bureau Harris. <laughs> um, we dropped that about 10 years ago. Um, so um, we, we we term ourselves local citizen's advice, um, and we are affiliated to, um, federated to a national organisation, um, which we variously call National Citizen's Advice or CITA, Um the national organisation has no responsibility for service delivery. The national organisation is there to support us as local charities to make sure um, to keep us on the right track, to help us with our governance, um, help us um, with working towards opportunities. And um, they will often have national contracts which they manage, but they then put out to the network, which is what we call ourselves as local citizens advice, they put those opportunities out to the network to deliver as a local citizens advice. There's about, um, I think it's about 280-ish local citizens advice in the country now. Um, that number's been coming down um, as, um, you know, we, we find ways of taking advantage of efficiencies, um, you know, services become more and more expensive to deliver. Um, funding isn't always available um, so <clears throat> um, that's what the citizens advice is so it's a local independent charity um, with our own board of trustees our own CEO um, and our own memorandum and articles um, you'll see I've got our vision and mission above us with my head there a fair society for all with lives well lived that's the vision and mission of citizens advice Gateshead that's quite different to the one for um, the national organization. And if you look around your own local citizens advice, go and find their website, you probably find that their vision, mission, strategic plan looks quite different to ours because we all have our own strategic direction. Um, I yeah, I, mean, I think I, I would add, I suppose when I came in to citizens advice as a complete starter in the organization, I found it quite interesting to understand that difference between the mm. two organizations and 
What I found really interesting around the national organisation is the amount of work they do around lobbying national government around um, services and around and being able to use all of the information that we as local citizen advice gather in our casework and working with clients to be able to demonstrate the need for our services and demonstrate particularly yeah. at the moment through the cost of living crisis the the actual frontline experience of both mm. our advice or services but also the clients that we serve and if any of you are into podcasts or looking at you know, kind of thought leadership I do think Claire Moriarty, who's the Citizens Advice and Chief Executive, she's a former permanent secretary within the civil service. She's very, I don't know about you, Judith, but I find her quite interesting to listen yeah. to. I think she's she's really done a lot for the organisation since she's been there. Um, and something else that they do, if you want to get an understanding of a, a, a national level, is they do a monthly cost of living um, podcast or mm-hmm. webinar that anybody can join where they actually pull together all of the information on what they're seeing across the country to be able to show to you, I, or anybody who is really interested in around the trends that I, we're seeing through um, advice within the UK. So um, there's, there's quite an interesting relationship between the national and the local organisations. And, um, you know, some, and I think, you know, there's, I think it's fair to say there's a lot of learning on both sides in terms of how we work together. But in terms of that overall thought leadership, I think it, it's a really it's a really great um, kind of um, piece of support to have. And it's something that we don't have in the organisation where I work now. So it's really a real benefit of working there and volunteering there. All right, thank you very much for that for that for those um introductions as well as you know giving us a bit more of a primer in terms of what the citizen advice does uh thank you for correcting me on that one judith it's less of a mouthful when you just have to yeah. say that's too, right so uh, that's a, a winning ticket in my book um <laughs> perfect um so could you explore with us a little bit in terms of the, the key roles uh i know judith you've you've had an extensive career at citizen advice mm-hmm roles for people who want to work at uh work at the organization both at the national and as well as level what does that look like and the differences between the two um so well yeah I I mean I've I've always been an advisor and that's sort of of one of the key roles that you can do um volunteer and 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 as a paid worker um and there's, there's there's lots of training and, and what have you to, to go along with that. And that's probably where most people think of working at Citizens Advice sits in being an advisor or supervising advice work. Um, very much that kind of um uh you know, legal advice talking about um, you know, your rights and responsibilities in in respect to welfare benefits, debt, money worries, housing, you know, any of those kind of civil law areas. Um but we, there's a bit more to it than that in that we're, we're there to support people through through what they're going through. So it's it's not just about, like, here's the law and off you go. Um, often there's work to be done around um, explaining what the law means and how it applies to those people, what the legislation means, but then also helping them with filling in complicated forms sometimes um, about... Um, about 40-45% of our work in Gateshead sits around welfare benefits. Um, a lot of that is about filling in forms. Um, there's a benefit called personal dependence payment. That form is 46 pages long. You know, if, you, if you're not sure what you're doing with it, if you've never seen it before, then it, it really is quite daunting. So, so a lot of our work is around that sort of stuff. It's not just the legislation. It is about rights and responsibilities, but also helping people to put that stuff in place. Um, I think um, then kind of moving up from there, being a manager in the citizen's advice um, doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be an advisor um, or even have that background. Um, I currently have um, in my team, we have a service manager, service delivery manager, and they didn't come to us as an advisor. Um, they had a, actually had an employability background, um, but has very successfully come into our service and has, you know, supported me with delivering the services that that they're responsible for. So just because you might not be an advisor or have a law background doesn't mean 
that skills are not transferable into um, the advice service. Um, you know, I would and anybody who's kind of thinking at that sort of level certainly think about what transferable skills might be to be a manager. Um, I mean, I, in fact, think about my experience in that. I I remember when I met with the CEO to talk about what I wanted to do, and she said, "You know, what, what's your interest?" I said, "Well." I've always been on the edge in the jobs that I've done of uh, bid writing. And I really like writing, but I've never actually done bid writing. And mm. she said, oh, she goes, well, she goes, if you're going to be looking to develop your skills in this area, she goes, we would, we always need people who can help us find money. Yeah. Well, I um, did some, t- some work in that. And then I began to understand some of the challenges the organisation was having coming out of COVID. One thing that they hadn't really done was to assess how pe- what people had learned through um, the COVID pandemic, through working at home mainly, and many people were only just coming back to the office. And what I then did was to say, well, I used to run workshops in the jobs that I worked in before. You know, we used to do, we used to do a lot of things around organisational development. So I actually volunteered and said I could organise these workshops and run them to get people back together to talk about learned experiences through the pandemic. And it, I think it was through that that I saw the transferability of my skills and, and the organisation saw it as well, because it was at that point that they said, actually, you think we've got some budget, we could really use somebody like you to pick up a whole load of things that we just don't have the time to do at the moment. So a job never actually existed that I did, and but they made it as a result of seeing what I could do. And, um, and I suppose it my biggest piece of advice would be don't underestimate skills that you might have developed anywhere. Yeah. Anything within an ordinary business as an, an element within a, city, a local citizen's life, there will be a need for, whether that be finance or fundraising or even a little bit of HR, it, it's all in there and somebody has to do it. Mm-hmm. Very often, I know, Judith, I, I, I wore about 15 hats at one point. Yeah. I'm sure it was yeah. no same for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um. The thing to remember about citizens advice, about local citizens advice is that um, they vary in size very much. Um, now we're we're one of the biggest. We're one of the top ten in the country. Um, so we have um, turnover of six million pounds, um, and we choose to invest money in in our infrastructure. Um, but uh, somewhere that's smaller that isn't quite as big, perhaps, um, and it's certainly certainly as sort of 10, 10, 12 years ago. Um, doesn't have the luxury of being able to invest in that infrastructure, and so so often you find that that you you're having to to wear many hats. Um, you know, especially especially as a manager, as I was, you, you know, looking after people and um, having to find ways of making sure I'm getting the HR right. Um, mm. You know, it, it's using those sort of skills as well um, where where you, where you need to. Um, Fundraising is all, as Lucy says, you know, somebody to get the money in so that somebody like me can spend it on advice time um, is really important. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's bid writing, there's fundraising, um, there's, there's, there's actually commercial development as well. Um, going out there, doing business development, um, you know, and, and, and working with um, perhaps with grant funders or, or local, um, even local corporates um, that, that could support a local citizen's advice. Um, that's really important. Um, having kind of sales skills, definitely something. Being able to talk to people, definitely something that's that's needed within a citizen's advice. Mm-hmm. Um, the the other the other thing that we do, um, which is really important, it's one of our twin aims as a citizen's advice. Um, and Lucy mentioned earlier the cost of living uh, webinars. Um, so. Uh, one of our and what the national organization do so yes we we give advice we support people with their rights and responsibilities but we also do that policy work so what we call a local level research and campaigns um and often what a research and campaign officer does is to gather the data and to gather the evidence that there's something unfair going on um it i mean it could be as as you know as, as serious as you know a local firm might be breaking the law about something um we had a situation um, a few years ago where um, a local, um, she, like a hairdresser, beauty salon type place, it came to our attention that she was using young women coming out fresh out of beauty college um, and using them as, as temporary um, workers um, and not paying them. So that, you know, there was a whole thing there, really local, that we really made a difference about. 
but also gathering evidence and putting into a national um, system so that nationally our voice can be heard together um, is really important for that policy change. So that's another area where we're, we're always looking for people to support with in terms of um, thinking about policy, um, we, you know, doing things like uh, writing white papers, um, you know, writing um, sort of gathering evidence and writing letters locally, perhaps to an MP or um, you know, the, or the local authority, if you feel that there's something going on locally that needs changing, that's that's another really important piece, that research piece. Um, and you've covered the question around, you know, what skills and qualities. It sounds like mm. uh, most skills um, and experience can be leveraged because uh, yeah. ultimately, you know, you know, if you've been in a private sector role or a public sector role, you are focusing, procuring <laughs> money uh, yeah. from somewhere friend, else. A friend of mine recently got in touch with me because her friend had recently retired as a head teacher but was looking to do something on a part-time basis and move in location and she said would you have a word with this person because she's got an interview to be a trainee advisor with a local citizen advice in London and um and she had a chat she goes what does it take and I said well I, I talked through you know the there would probably be some really great questions around equality and diversity and um, there'll be a there'll be a emphasis on safeguarding and any knowledge that that person had to be able to be able to bring in at that and the ability to listen to empathize and 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 she was successful in getting the job so she went from to be a trainee advisor from being a head teacher and I think the the case is when you look into recruit people you always just want really good people and we all go into interviews thinking I just hope this person is going to be one so it's just being able to understand how you can transfer those skills into that new role yeah, definitely. that's an awesome example. Um, I love that because it's completely <laughs> different as an industry, um, but they've managed to leverage those skill sets. And I imagine managing teachers <laughs> in terms of providing training <laughs> um, is is a great pivot. Um, awesome. Um, and I think you might have touched on it a little bit, um, but it, in terms of specifically, you know, going from volunteering to paid employment, how does that operate at Citizens Advice? What are the, some some examples you might have? Um, for people who might start with a volunteering mm -hmm. hat on, but eventually mm -hmm. have a view of, well, can this transition to some sort of part-time, full-time mm -hmm. basis? Mm -hmm. So I, I um, for a while, managed the volunteer coordinator at Coventry, and she undertook a recruitment campaign for some new volunteer advisors. And they were generally spending between maybe six and nine hours a week working as and, and training as um, voluntary advisors within the local citizens advice. When I went back to visit probably about three or four weeks ago, one of those people who were coming in that cohort of advisors when I was there had got a paid job on the reception in the citizens advice I worked at. And that will have been literally a, we've got a vacancy here. We're gonna be going out to advertise and she was invited to apply. So it, it's kind of, you know, when when things come up it's very often, like in my own situation, it was quite serendipitous, really, in terms of how it happened. But again, it comes back to if we see good people as volunteers and there are opportunities, they will be first in the queue to be invited to apply. From that's my experience. So, Judith, would you echo? Yeah, that? no, I, I, absolutely. We 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 asked folk, um, you know, if if they wanted to apply, if it was something that they wanted to try the hand at. Um, but also um, we will always give, at Gateshead, we'll always give our volunteers an interview um, if they apply for a role. So, so there's, there's always a guaranteed interview for, for a volunteer who's applying for anything. Um, and it is, it is just about, um, you know, waiting for, the, waiting for the role to come up. I mean, that's, that's exactly how I got paid work um, yeah. by, um, you know, something came up um, and it was seen that I was in, in the right place in my training program and, and was, was able to, to slip into that role. Um, we have a lot of volunteers in our organisation have moved into paid work in our, in, within a charity. Um, and we see it very much as a, as a progression route. So, you know, very much you come in as a volunteer, you can stay as a volunteer if that's what you'd like to do, if, if you're not looking for paid work, but, but we, we do absolutely see it as a progression route. Um, 
you know, and, and the, the, the training's the same, except usually for, certainly for an advisor, if you're moving from a volunteer advisor to a paid advisor, um, you know, there's, there's, there's not masses more training to do for, for that shift unless you kind of go into one, a more specialist role. That's awesome. Um, so to pivot the conversation a little bit in terms of the context of the people that we have on the call, um, mm -hmm. obviously Brave Starts, you know, is a not-for-profit focusing on supporting the experienced workforce, live longer, fuller working lives. Uh, and this specifically is tailored around 50 plus demographic. Um, what benefits do you see from this particular sort of cohort of people in terms of the citizens' advice and what value uh, and expertise that can they bring um, to this, uh, to the work that you're doing? Life experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, just, just, you know, you, you've, you've probably all got one of the t-shirts somewhere in your cupboard, um, mm -hmm. guarantee it. Um, and it's that life experience that, that, that will help you, um, working at citizens advice. Um, I think often um, there is an element of resilience needed as well. And, and you know, as I, certainly as I've got older, um, resilience has grown because stuff does happen. But um, it's it's also, I think there's, there's, there's also an element of having had that or, you know, how you have that life experience, it helps you actually take a step back um, and not get too involved in things. You know, often I see some of our younger people um wanting to really get hold of things and sort it out and and you know and they, they talk about oh I, I couldn't stop thinking about that client last night and it's like no you've got to stop thinking about that client last night um so I I often think that um being older allows you to recognize you've done everything you can um and that you, that you you know you can empathize with what's going on um but not not take it home um and but also understanding that there are ways out of everything um you know you, you're still here <laughs> um there are ways out of everything and that you, you're here to help them through something and it's not the end of the world that this thing has happened to them that they will get through it so that's what your job is to help them get through it rather than hold the hand and drag them kicking and screaming through it um <laughs> and i think from the yeah. non-advice side it's the the skills that people can bring up that they may have developed either in a corporate environment or in another kind of maybe a managerial role that are equally valuable within citizens' advice. Um, so I think that, that for me is the key thing that I saw and I brought. I mean, I decided to look at volunteering as a way to get into something new because mm. I got quite an interest in what my career might look like um, beyond maybe into 60 and um, age of 70 when I think we're probably all going to, be working a little bit longer either by choice or because we really have to so my my real motivation was to explore those opportunities and understand what things may be a little bit more and um, that helped me to be a little bit more flexible in my approach as I get older in terms of what I might do and one of the things that Citizens Advice does very well is it is very flexible in the way that it employs people uh, in terms of part-time roles flexible working I would say I, I don't know the stats on how many roles within the whole network are part time, but I would I would have to guess that it's pretty high for the advisor roles. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a way like that friend of mine who was looking to downside a bit on a career, but still do something which is really quite mentally challenging and and something which is going to help others. It, it's a really really good opportunity to explore. So the organisation wins because it gets the skills of people who have got as Judy said, that experience, and then the people win because it's, without wanting to sound too cheesy about things, it really is a fantastic way to give back. Yeah. So there, there is, a, it is a, a, a win on both sides for me. Mm -hmm. I think there's another role that we've probably not covered, and that's that, that of a trustee. Um, mm -hmm. And, a, a, you know, trustees are always needed in, in a lot of charities. Um, and volunteering as a trustee is is also very important. Um, now, you might sit there and think, yes, but trustees don't get paid. But actually, being a trustee within a charity is is a really good CV builder um, because you're 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 bringing skills to to that to that charity to support them to um, perhaps improve in some way. And you know, whatever skills you might have, I'm sure would be valued by a charity, including a local citizens' advice. 
but then but then having having that input into the um, charity as a trustee will then help you transfer skills into something else as well. Um, and trustees, you know, are there, are there about governance and um, supporting, particularly supporting the CEO um, in in actually running the organisation. What's the best starting point for our members um, in terms of, you know, understanding and finding out more of what's available at Citizens Advice in terms of volunteering and paid employment? Um, and what are the other ways they can really get involved? Um, it'd be yeah. great to hear from yourselves on that. Um, well, I'm about to drop a link into the chat um, about volunteering roles at cis, local at your local citizens' advice. Um, so, you know, have a look at the website is my first um, suggestion, and then my second suggestion is go along and have a chat. Um, mm -hmm. Most um, local citizens' advice will have somebody who fulfills the role of a of a volunteer lead, volunteer coordinator. Um, so go along and have a chat with them. Um, and even if volunteering is not really for you and you're thinking about, um, you know, what does a job, what does a job look like? I think it's still worth having having that conversation and, and just seeing, um, you know, what, what there is about about your local citizens advice. Um, and also, you know, if, if you see an advert for something that you fancy, just just go and, you know, go and ask them for a conversation um, before you apply for anything. Um, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to have a chat with you about the role. And the, I certainly would. <laughs> the National Citizens Advice website has a vacancies page on there. So if you want to do some research around paid roles as well, the roles on there are advertised, advertised both in the national organisation, but also um, local citizens advice can advertise their own there. So you'll see the spread across the country for the different um, roles that are available to be paid as well. That's awesome. Um, so it sounds like there's sort of three artifacts. The first one is the the, the link that you shared, um, Judith, um, and then there's sort of the national uh, website as well. And then they can um, you can literally go to the citizens advice um, and you know see and have a chat is that sort of physically going to um the location or is this or is it all online um no I, it's well i don't think it's all online i'm sure that many officers well i know that many officers are um in the same place that we are with with, with very much hybrid working um some officers haven't actually reopened since um since lockdown um but i would i would just get in touch um Often, you know, the, the on the local site on the Citizens Advice website that I've popped into chat, there'll be contact information available there. Um, you might find it a bit tricky to find a phone number um, mm. because quite often um, we'll advertise advice phone numbers, um, and you might not get very far in trying to speak to anybody specifically. But if you if you go through the volunteering link that, and the the working link that Lucy and I have just talked about. Um, that's a better route in to get a conversation with somebody rather than trying to phone the main advice line numbers that you might see advertised yeah. locally. That tends to be inundated at the moment. Yeah. At least. <laughs> yeah. Two million calls go unanswered on that on that um, line um, every year. So yeah, that's that after we've answered about that's the same number of calls. <laughs> well, that's a big stat. Um, yeah. Uh, Fascinating. No, thank you very much, uh, Judith and Lucy. Really appreciate your time uh, this evening to take us through uh, and walk through you know, a little bit more about citizens' advice, what you do, what are the potential opportunities um, that can be leveraged, both from a volunteering and paid employment perspective, what sort of skills and expertise um, that you need, spoiler alert, you know, life experience, and, <laughs> and I'm sure we could transfer any skills that you have. So, uh, that's really awesome and, and you've given us some great resources in terms of um, the next steps in terms of specific opportunities available. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate your time.